All right. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, three proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Gallagher. Uh, uh, dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion, the Prime Minister's ongoing failure to show leadership. Is the proposal supported? The proposal uh, being supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I'll ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, I think everyone in this chamber recognises that the summer we've seen has been one of the most dreadful on record, uh, particularly in relation to the bushfires that this country has seen. Uh, yesterday, of course, we devoted the day to a condolence motion to recognise those uh, who lost their lives in these fires, 33 Australians, including nine firefighters, who lost their lives during these bushfires. And I commend uh, everyone on the speeches that they made today. Uh, in, during my contribution to that debate, I did recognise that a condolence motion was not the place uh, to talk about some of the gross failures of leadership that we saw from the Prime Minister and this government in the lead-up to the fires, during the fires and in their response to the fires. But I did say that that is something that needs to be discussed. Uh, this government does need to be held account to account for its failures in relation to these fires, and I intend to use this debate uh, to do that today. The truth is uh, this Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, displayed an unbelievable lack of leadership during, before, during and after the bushfires. Now, as has been said by many commentators and many Australians that I've spoken to, natural disasters and other significant events tend to be the time when our leaders actually stand up. That's when leadership tends to come to the fore. Even people who otherwise would be seen as fairly mediocre le leaders find an extra gear during national disasters uh, and really demonstrate leadership, throw, pull the nation together or pull their state together and show a way forward, inspire people, uh, uh, ensure that people have the confidence and the comfort to know that they can get through and then forge a path out of those disasters or other significant events afterwards. Um, some of the better leaders that Australia has seen uh, have come to the fore during natural, natural disasters. And even just in recent times, Kevin Rudd during the Black Saturday bushfires, Anna Bly during the 2011 Queensland floods uh, have done so. And it's been done on all sides of politics. Uh, I'll give John Howard credit for the leadership that he showed after the Port Arthur massacre. And even during these fires, we've, shown in, we've seen incredible leadership from a number of figures. Again, not restricted to one side of politics. The New South Wales Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, I think has been recognised as having demonstrated leadership. The Victorian Premier, Daniel Andrews, I think has been recognised similarly. Uh, of course, some of the officials in charge of the response to the fires, including Shane Fitzsimmons, the head of the uh, Rural Fire Service in New South Wales, and so many ordinary Australians showed leadership, whether that be uh, firefighters, whether that be volunteers who've fed the firefighters and done other volunteering jobs, uh, people who've cared for wildlife, so many ordinary Australians whose names we will never know showed true leadership through these fires. But there was one person who the entire nation would have expected would have demonstrated leadership during these fires, who comprehensively failed to do so. And of course, that's the Prime Minister. If there's one person in this country that you would expect during a nationwide, almost, natural disaster, it's the Prime Minister. But what do we see from this Prime Minister? Well, in the lead up to the fires, he did nothing to prevent them. The planning and the preparation for these fires, as is so often the case with this government, 
this do-nothing government. He did nothing about the planning and the preparation of these fires. When the fires hit, he went missing in action. Unseen, unavailable, nothing to see here, nothing to say to the Australian people. And when he did eventually have to face up to what was happening in these fires, rather than take responsibility, he tried to blame others and, as we have come to expect from this Prime Minister, he was loose with the truth. He demonstrated the very opposite of leadership. And again, this is not something that has just been observed by people who are political opponents of the Prime Minister. Uh, the recent opinion piece by Nikki Sava, a former adviser to Liberal governments. I'll have one quote. Uh, Elections are not tests of prime ministers. They are tests of politicians and their campaign skills. Scott Morrison passed that with honours last May. National crises are the true tests of prime ministers and leadership. The sad truth is that Morrison faltered and stumbled miserably, sometimes seemingly willfully, at almost every critical point during this rotten summer, beginning with his ill-advised holiday to Hawaii. So that's not a Labor person. That's one of the Liberal Party's long-time advisers with an absolutely scathing assessment of this Prime Minister's leadership. Now, I understand today the Prime Minister was asked what he learned about leadership over the summer, and his response was this, always to listen, always to show up, always put Australians first. Well, my question is, why did it take a natural disaster for this Prime Minister to learn that leadership involves listening to people? Why did it take a disaster that has claimed the lives of 33 people for this Prime Minister to learn that leadership means showing up? Why did it take the loss of 3,000 homes, 1 billion animals and over 10 million hectares of bushland for the Prime Minister to learn that leadership means putting Australians first? Now, this is not just political rhetoric. The, the Prime Minister's lack of leadership has had serious consequences. His actions, his lack of leadership, placed Australians at risk, he placed our economy at risk, and he placed our environment at risk. The truth is that this Prime Minister comprehensively failed the test of leadership in planning for the bushfires, in responding to the bushfires and, as we are already seeing, in recovering from these bushfires. Now, time does not permit me to go through every example of that failure of leadership from the Prime Minister, but I will remind the Senate of some of the more notable ones. When it comes to the planning and preparation for these bushfires, the Prime Minister cannot say that he wasn't warned that this was coming. One of the things that came out over the Christmas break was that the incoming government briefs from the Department of Home Affairs provided to this government after the May election warned about the serious risk that this country faced from bushfires. So if they didn't know about it before the election, they certainly did afterwards. The uh, CRC uh, for bush, bushfire and natural disaster research that the government hasn't com committed funding for into the future, it issued its August outlook and warned of an above average fire risk for Australia this bushfire season. And then, of course, there were the ex-fire chiefs who repeatedly sought to meet with the, the Prime Minister to inform him of the risk that we faced and provide him with some solutions about what could be done to mitigate that risk. They wrote to the Prime Minister in April, seeking a meeting, never got a response. They wrote to the, minute, the Prime Minister again in September, no response. And he still hasn't met with them. Even after these fires, he's not willing to swallow his pride and meet with people, dozens of people, who have decades of experience in fighting these kinds of fires. Uh, and it is arrogance, Senator Polly. It is arrogance from the Prime Minister. So what would they have told him if, they, if he had met with them, if he had deigned to meet with people with decades of experience in fighting fires? Well, just one thing of the many things they would have told him was the need for more water bombing aircraft in this country. They weren't the first to make this point. The National Aerial Firefighting Centre, which coordinates water bombers across this country, first requested funding from this government four years ago. Four years ago, they asked for funding to increase the firefighting fleet. No response. 
They submitted a business case to this government seeking a permanent funding increase two years ago. I knew about it. I'm the shadow, I'm the shadow minister. I'm not the, not the government. I knew about this request and I asked about it in estimates last year. Uh, and they didn't, they didn't respond to it then. It was nine months after Labor made an election commitment to have more water bombing aircraft. It was six weeks after the opposition leader, Mr Albanese, asked for more firefighting aircraft before the government responded. And of course, of course it was months after the fires began. Now, this is one of many examples that I could give, and I could reel off examples of the government and the Prime Minister failing the leadership test in the response and the recovery as well. There'll be more time to do that into the future. This Prime Minister comprehensively failed the leadership test over this summer. His actions have put Australia at risk. Uh, he Senator needs to Watt, show leadership into the future. Your time has expired. Senator Abetz. Well, what a tawdry display of petty partisan politics the Senate has just been subjected to by Senator Watt, allegedly a leading light of the Australian Labor Party, coming as he does from the state of Queensland, which gave the Labor Party what was the primary vote again at the last election? And you see, this motion is not about the fires, it is about leadership. And when you have a look at leadership, can I say that leadership is the ability to direct and motivate others to achieve individual and team goals? And can I say Mr Morrison delivered by the bucket load in relation to that on May the 18th? Because Order. when the Australian Labor Party thought that they were going to sail into office virtually unopposed, the simple fact is Mr Morrison was able to ensure that individuals won their seats and that the people of Australia, in listening to the messages that he had on offer in comparison to the Labor Party, switched their vote from that which Labor thought was going to be theirs over to the coalition. And that is why the Australian Labor Party continues to sit on the opposition benches. Now, let's be very clear. Senator Watt just delivered ten minutes of diatribe against the Prime Minister, saying what a failure the Prime Minister is. In that ten minutes, not a single nanosecond was spent on what the Labor Party might have done in the event that they were in office. No alternative to offer the Australian people. And of course, when it comes to the specific issue of fires, who is responsible for fire management? Who is responsible for land management? Who is responsible for fuel reduction burns in the forests? Order. It is the state governments. Who is responsible for asking the federal government to get involved in these issues? It is the specific state governments, and they have all agreed that everything which was asked of the federal government in the circumstances of the fires was in fact delivered. But this motion, as it's put before us, is a general statement of the, alleging the Prime Minister's ongoing failure to show leadership. Well, I know this Prime Minister before he was Prime Minister. He didn't show any leadership at all, did he, on border protection, something that Labor failed to deliver on time and time again. Mr Morrison delivered on border protection, showing leadership, go going against that which the Australian Labor Party said could not be done. Labor said it couldn't be done. Mr Morrison stood up and delivered for the Australian people. That is what leadership is, doing what is right in circumstances when everybody else is throwing stones at you that the left-wing media in this country and the Australian Labor Party are so very good at. And of course, the leadership that is required in this nation, Mr Acting Deputy President, is not only to throw rocks, as the Australian Labor Party does, because that is not leadership, it is to set out an alternative. And so why didn't Senator Watts spend a nanosecond of his speech telling us about the alternative Labor agenda? Because he can't. Where do they stand on negative gearing? Where do they stand on frank dividends? Where do they stand in relation to coal mining in Australia? They had their leader go up to Queensland and say, I support coal mining. 
and then goes down to Victoria saying, I don't support coal mining, and then they wonder why the Australian people say there is a lack of leadership and direction within the Australian Labor Party. Can I say those people that might be listening into this debate would be a lot more interesting interested in hearing Senator Watt and the Australian Labor Party telling us about their alternate policies, what they would do if they were in government, as to why people should vote for them, because their alternative is so much better. But no, all it was was the typical vacuous vitriol that the Labor Party is so good at throwing across the chamber but are incapable of providing a genuine alternative to the people of Australia. So, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, let's be very clear. The leadership of Mr Morrison has protected our borders, helped us get our budget back into shape in such a manner that we are now able to face the elements of the fires, a coronavirus and those curved balls that are bowled up to us from time to time, and because of the resilience of our budget, courtesy of budget, budget management, which was very much part of Mr Morrison's portfolio prior to becoming Prime Minister, and now as Prime Minister, there has been a legacy of leadership by Mr Morrison that the Labor Party simply draw over, because they don't know what leadership is. Mr Shorten was the great leader, dumped pushed aside, and now it's Mr Albanese without any, without, without any vision for the future, without any alternative to, dis, uh, to provide to the Australian people. And then the great, the great um, authority that Senator Watt seeks to quote is a person that is on the public record as saying that, as a journalist, she had lied and made up sources. And that is the sort of person that Senator Watt has to rely on to try to give a single feather to his wing. But can I tell you that single feather won't get this motion to fly, especially, especially when it is such a stripped feather in relation to Order. questions of integrity. When somebody self-admits that that is how they operated as a journalist, and you then seek to quote them as a great authority is indicative of how little information, how little support there was for the proposition that Senator Watt is seeking to put to this chamber this evening. The simple fact is that the Prime Minister has shown leadership on every single occasion, on every portfolio that he has held. And what is more, his leadership has been supported by the Australian people in the only poll that counts, and that was on May the 18th. And we saw the sinking faces of the Labor people and my good friend Senator Wong and others who were doing the commentary, starting the night with a big grin, and especially the ABC commentators, looking forward to a Labor win. And of course, by the end of the evening, they were looking extremely glum and upset. And Senator Watt interjecting as he does, having got Order. what 22 per cent of the primary vote in his home Order. state of Tasmania, looked uh, in, of Queensland, looked extremely glum, extremely glum, and with good reason. And what was the reason that most sensible commentators said was the leadership of Mr. Morrison? that he had pulled the government through by standing firm, by not listening to all the commentariat, all the Labor brickbats that were thrown at him, but simply holding a course, knowing that what he was saying, what he was doing, was the right formula for the benefit of the Australian people. And that is what we are now continuing to deliver, good, sound economic management, decisive action in relation to the coronavirus, decisive action in retaining strong borders, decisive action in maintaining a good budget position. And you can go through the list, committing to the reduction of power prices, reducing welfare dependency, modernising our defence force, a record level of infrastructure investment, further investment in our schools and hospitals, standing up for our 
interest and sovereignty on the world stage. And the list literally goes on. Opposing union lawlessness, establishing a task force to protect against foreign interference. This is a list of actual achievements, of actual leadership, of the sort of leadership that the Australian people voted for, wanted, and they are now benefiting from as a result of that which Mr Morrison is delivering for the Australian people. I simply say to the Australian Labor Party that throwing rocks is not a substitute for a sound policy formula which might actually excite the interest of the Australian people. If you want to be a fair dinkum player on the Australian political stage, you can't just throw rocks, engage in vitriol. You've got to engage in genuine public policy development and ensure that the Australian people support you. And that is what Mr Morrison Senator achieved Beth, on May the 18th. Your time has expired. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Crisis can bring about the best in people, and indeed it has brought out the best in our communities this summer. But sadly, it has also brought out the worst in the Prime Minister of Australia. What we needed during this bushfire and climate disaster was courageous, truthful and wise leadership. What we got from the Prime Minister and this government was the exact opposite. They have been cowardly, dishonest and incompetent, full of science deniers. They have behaved like a bunch of climate criminals with Scotty from marketing at their head. Even before he fled to Hawaii, the Prime Minister showed himself completely incapable of any sort of leadership. He refused to give payments to volunteer firefighters until he was dragged to the table. He refused to meet with former emergency services chiefs who were trying to warn him about this impending disaster. He refused to acknowledge that the climate crisis had made bushfires more frequent and more intense. Instead, he sent his ministers off to block global climate action in Madrid. He put a misogynist, climate-denying MP on international television. He behaved pathetically in the community, forcing people to shake his hand and running away from the criticism Order. he well- Order. Senator Fruki, please resume your seat. Uh, Minister. Point of order. Um, uh, I'd ask you to ask Senator Faruqi to withdraw the uh, aspersions that she cast on a member of the other place uh, in her speech just then. Uh, Senator Faruqi, Senator Seselja is correct. Uh, I believe you should withdraw your comment regarding uh, uh, one of our colleagues from the other place. Comment was that, Mr Acting President? I'm not going to repeat it. I think we all know which comment it was, Senator Faruqi. Sorry, I'm not clear, but sure, I would draw. Okay, please continue. Uh, our Prime Minister behaved pathetically in the community, forcing people to shake his hand, running away from the criticism he well and truly deserved. Honestly, if he won't do the right thing and resign, he should probably just head back off to Hawaii. But we need more than just a change in useless leaders. We need real leadership and a wholesale shake-up of our political, social and economic systems. Now, I wouldn't want anyone to think that the Prime Minister's failure to lead is isolated just on inaction on climate. He is not fit to lead on any front. We see this in everything from his government's ongoing cuts to education, his alarmist, xenophobic China travel ban and his response to the sports rot scandal. Yes, former Minister Mackenzie had to step down, but everyone in the government from the PM down benefited from the coordinated pork, belling, pork barreling. If Scott Morrison were anything other than a failed leader, he would Senator take responsibility Faruqi, and step your down. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to this MPI and the ongoing crisis in leadership engulfing the Morrison government. We have a Prime Minister who does not know the meaning of the word leadership, let alone the ability to show any. And what we had from Sandra Betts 
previously is a speech you hear over and over and over again from him. But the reality is there's one thing about the fact that Morrison won the federal election, and yes, that's true, the Australian people elected him as Prime Minister. But what the Australian people have seen during this crisis across this country, with state after state being engulfed in fires, is that they do not have the trust or faith in this Prime Minister. He has the ability to put people offside at a time when normally a prime minister grows in statues during a national crisis. But we've seen a very arrogant prime minister. We've seen a very indecisive prime minister. We've seen a prime minister who has no empathy, a man who is okay being the prime minister but is unwilling, unwilling to execute the office with any semblance of responsibility. Australia has a Prime Minister that does not believe that ministers should be held accountable and to the highest standards. He was unwilling to do the right thing and stand aside Senator Mackenzie, the Minister for the Sports Rorts. He was unwilling to act. And then when he decided that he was going to have an investigation because uh, he didn't like and he wanted to ignore the independent Auditor General's report, he then got his former chief of staff, who heads up the Prime Minister's department, to investigate. Well, that shows the integrity of this Prime Minister. We'll get some, one of our own to actually investigate one of our own. When it was quite clear the Australian community did not accept and would never accept and pass a pub test of how Senator Mackenzie, when she was uh, the Minister for uh, Sport, how she rorted the grants program. Now, this grants program is very different to commitments, and I know the Liberals have been very quick to say, oh, this happens all the time in the elections, you see, and you hear the same rhetoric. There is a very stark difference between the Commonwealth Government grants programs for, for sport than election commitments. So what we have seen from the Prime Minister is that he has in fact exposed himself to the Australian people. We have seen his pattern of behaviour. The Australian people have seen him and they do not have, do not have any faith in him. Not only was he slow to react to the bushfire crisis, was he also, I think, showing poor judgment by going overseas on a holiday uh, during that crisis. He's failed to address the shonky behaviour and the rorting of the former Minister for Sport, but also he, there's still questions hanging over Mr Taylor. Now, it's quite clear that the Prime Minister is both arrogant and he is a shonky Prime Minister who is leading a shonky government who are not accountable, who believe that they're above everyone else in this country and he does not take responsibility for the lack of transparency by his minister, ministers. Now, what we have seen is that uh, Mr Morrison, yes, during the last election, he was pretty good at marketing, pretty slick really. But what he's done now is demonstrated very clearly to the Australian people who he really is, who he really is. Now, the fire crisis had gripped our country and it was horrendous. It was horrendous. We saw our firefighters and volunteers putting their life on the line and unfortunately, some losing those. We have our overseas friends and neighbours and allies that have come to assist us on the front line. And then what the Prime Minister says when he comes back from Hawaii was, well, the Australian people knew that he wouldn't be out there holding a hose. Well, of course they don't expect him to be at the fire front. But what they do expect, and what every other Prime Minister in my lifetime, and I think even beyond that, have always done through a national crisis, and that is be there, be front and centre, making sure that the Australian people knew exactly what was happening, what resources were being available and acting in their best interest. But no, he was slow off the mark. 
What he was more interested in was roaming around, forcing people to hand, give him a handshake when quite clearly they were distressed. They had been at the front line of this fire. They had lost their homes, and all he wanted was a picture opportunity. That was this Prime Minister. He also was quite quick to blame the New South Wales Premier, one of his own colleagues, shifting the blame to someone else because, don't touch me, oh, Mr Teflon, I don't have to be accountable to anyone. Well, I can assure you the Australian people have seen right through him. How insensitive and what a very clear demonstration of the lack of empathy by this Prime Minister to actually go up to someone and grab their hand and want to shake it when they were so visual, visibly upset and understandably so. There was such loss of life. He went to Kangaroo Island and his insensitivity there when he talked about no one losing their lives. That was crushing, crushing to the residents and visitors of Kangaroo Island. And that was a message that was relayed out to the Australian community. Well, he should hang his head in shame. I would be embarrassed if I was on that side of the chamber to see a prime minister who failed so miserably during a national crisis. We all look to the leadership. It's irrelevant whether it's a Liberal or a Labor government at a time in, in the country's crisis, we rally together and we look to that Prime Minister for leadership to give people comfort and solace to know that their government is standing by them. Because Australians expect that we stand shoulders to shoulder with them. We do that. That's what we as Aussies do. We stand up for one another. So for a Prime Minister so clearly to demonstrate that he's not fit for the job, we couldn't ask for anything better from a political point of view on our side. But that's not what we want to see at a time of crisis. We want to be able to be proud of whoever holds that office, that they are going to be front and centre, being the figurehead with respect, with empathy and understanding, and that they act immediately, sitting back and saying, oh, well, now I've got to change the rules so I can bring out the army. To have the Defence Force, the issue that I think galls me the most, and to the Australians that have raised it with me, is the fact that this Prime Minister, who slipped back to being Mr Scotty Morrison, the marketing man, to do an ad, to do an ad using the Defence Force. And let's not forget he himself authorised that, but when you had to click the link for a, to make a donation, where do you think that link took them? To the veterans. No. Must have taken to the veterans. Not to the veterans. No, sorry, Senator Lambie, not to them. Not to those who have been victims of the fire crisis. No, not at all. It was to the Liberal Party. He wanted to use the distress, the crisis in this country, the sweat and tears of our firefighters and our volunteers to raise money for his political party. He should be ashamed of himself. And those people on that side of the chamber should also be hanging their heads in shame. I have never, ever seen anything like that. Never. It was appalling and shows the lack of judgment. It also shows the arrogance of this man. It shows the arrogance of a prime minister who is so out of touch. He might have worked in advertising previously, but his spin and his smoke and mirrors have been exposed, and so they should and I don't believe that the Australian people will forget his inaptitude for being Prime Minister during a time of crisis, and he is a disgrace. Senator Polly, your time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. You know, there was a time when, if we had national, um, natural disasters, and we have a lot of natural disasters in Queensland quite regularly, politicians would put politics aside 
and get on with doing what was necessary to support communities through that difficulty as they dealt with cyclones, floods and bushfires. Queenslanders will remember the speeches that then Premier Anna Bly and then Lord Mayor Campbell Newman gave during the floods that occurred through Brisbane and Ipswich in 2011. They rallied Queenslanders to help one another, pull together, clean up after the floods, and you know what? We did. Was there then a call for the then Prime Minister Gillard to show leadership? No. No, there wasn't. And at first glance, you might think this represents a double standard. You might think that that means there's one rule for Labor and a different standard applied for those on this side of the chamber. Natural disaster management, as those opposite well know, is properly a matter for the states and territories. The senators opposite know that's the reason why the Prime Minister wasn't roasted about it in 2011. Section 51 of the Constitution specifically sets out what the Commonwealth is responsible for and, by virtue of being the Prime Minister, where the PM is supposed to act. Nothing in there that says it's a Commonwealth responsibility, and yet the selective ignorance of the Constitution on that side stands out every time. The Commonwealth can only act in circumstances of a natural disaster when they're asked to do so by the states. And for them to roll on in and try and take charge without their invitation, without their asking, is nothing short really of a coup d'etat. So you want to hear about leadership? Well, how about a PM who commits to working with the states to set up a long-term protocol for when we need to bring in military assistance to help in natural catastrophes? in a way that means the failure of the states to accept other federal offers to assist, as happened in the bushfires this summer, won't happen again. How about this leadership? Taking the unprecedented step of calling out around 6,500 Australian Defence Force personnel to rescue people from danger, to distribute supplies, to help clean up the mess, calling out 3,000 reservists providing the comforting presence of knowing that help was on the way when state governments were nowhere to be seen. That's leadership. There's another key leadership trait that Liberals and Nationals rate highly, and that is financial responsibility. As Treasurer, the now Prime Minister had the goal of a balanced budget, and together with now Treasurer Frydenberg, they have delivered the first balanced budget, and surplus is a word we can use now. Now, those opposite, the last time they delivered a surplus was a long time ago. Can you remember the year, those opposite? We can. It was 1989. I was in year one. I was reading Dr Seuss books. I had a spiky fringe that didn't really date well in the photos. A lot has changed since 1989, but the economic credentials of those opposite haven't. Not all fashion decisions date well, but I can tell you their economic policies have dated even worse. Labor doesn't see responsible financial management as a good leadership quality. They don't value it. But you know what? Without it, there wouldn't be the capacity for Australia to be able to provide immediate financial support to Australians affected by bushfires. $52.6 million has been paid out to 44,150 people, people who have had nothing more than a quickly packed suitcase as they evacuated, $1,000 per eligible adult, $800 per eligible child, an amount that was doubled to assist with back-to-school costs, and disaster support payments that were paid in less than 20 minutes in over 90 per cent of cases. And yet, late last year, Labor were in this chamber demanding that any potential surplus be spent up big. Boost all the welfare spending right now, they said. Well, of course they did. That surplus was burning a hole, and it wasn't even their money. It was the Australian people's money, and it wasn't even in their pocket, and yet it was burning so hard 
They felt like from the opposition benches they had the right to demand how the government governed on behalf of the Australian people who elected it. But without the leadership the Prime Minister showed in holding fast in spite of all of that pressure, there wouldn't have been the resources to set up a bushfire recovery fund, to fund it with $2 billion to cover the establishment of the National Bushfire Recovery Agency, which will be headed by well-respected former AFP Commissioner Andrew Colvin. That agency will be there for as long as it takes to help individuals, to help families, to help businesses big and small and communities get back on their feet. The agency will distribute $2 billion to local councils and to the states. It will provide support, counselling, to make sure that there is both mental health support and financial support for those people who are struggling with the recovery. It will help organisations that are working to heal sick and injured wildlife who have been harmed by this disaster and to help work to restore their habitats. It will go to charities to help provide direct financial assistance to those assessed to need it. It will double funding to the National Aerial Firefighting Centre because, let's face it, fires are a continuing part of the Australian way of life. And it will fund domestic and international tourism campaigns to help get inbound tourist dollars back to the areas that have been affected. And yet, here we are in this chamber, not talking about the important bills needed to make this stuff happen. We're not here talking about the policy agenda that is front of mind for Australians, how we pay our bills, how we buy our home, how we get ahead, how we educate our kids. No. We're here arguing about the petty semantics of what those opposite think constitutes sufficient leadership against goalposts that they shift to different places depending on who is in government. And it just ain't fair. It's time to call bull on that. And so it's worth stopping to cut through all that political nonsense and think about what we mean when we talk about leadership. It means knowing what you stand for, being frank about it, and not being pushed around by those who might want to bully you around to their position. And so quiet Australians nationwide are pleased to see the Prime Minister dealing with our climate in a way that is balanced, in a way that cares for our environment whilst making sure no one's jobs are put in jeopardy, that achieves improvements in the way we go about generating energy using developments in technology rather than draconian measures designed to send us back to the Stone Age. And they are so pleased to see a Prime Minister who doesn't cave in to the hysteria of those opposite. You know, we've seen from Labor and from the Greens, and from the media for that matter, a determination to tell Australians why they got their judgment wrong at the last election rather than listening to what they're trying to say. They're not being listened to by the people I've described. But you know who is listening? The Prime Minister and this government are listening. The Prime Minister knows he's got two ears and one mouth for a reason, and he listens to the people who speak quietly, the people who are working hard, the people who are raising their kids, the people who are building their businesses, the people who are shaping their local communities. Because you know what? They're too busy to be activists. They're too busy to be lining the streets shouting hysterically a la Greta Thunberg, they're building this country, helping it be the best it can be. Leadership is about courage, it's about conviction, and it's about holding fast when people like those opposite get hysterical and pretend that there's only one way to ensure that we have a good balance between jobs and the environment in this country. And the PM understands what's necessary to make sure the jobs of Australians are always front of mind, even as we do all we can to protect our natural environment. But if you want to see bad leadership, well, come to my home state of Queensland and take a look at the Labor state government. We've had Premier Palaszczuk telling fibs on Sunrise about the information that she's Senator been provided. Senator Stoker, your time has expired. And we now move on to Senator Lambie.
Thank you, Mr. President. Today, I'd like to talk about one particular area where the Prime Minister could show some real leadership: political donations reform. The coalition finally told the Australian public this week about the 24 million they received in political donations. The Labor Party released information about 18 mil. Here's a news flash for anyone who hasn't noticed. It's now February. The election was in May last year. Money changed hands between donors and parties more than eight months ago, and we're only finding out about it now. Even though we don't have all the details, we know enough to wonder, have we been sold out? Have you sold us out? Because big business and lobby groups are secretly donating millions to the Liberal and Labor parties and putting pressure on them to change their policies. Crown Casino gave to both parties, and both parties voted against investigating Crown's alleged corruption. The gaming lobby gave over a million to both parties, and both parties have the same policy on pokies. Surprise, surprise. I mean, what exactly do these donors think they're buying with all this money? And you are trying to pretend to us that they just throw their money around because they value our democracy that much? Bloody rubbish! Absolute rubbish! Let's get real here. These disclosures are too late and too limited. You can bet that the big donors have already gotten their big bang for their buck. They've cashed in before we knew anything about it, and it's just not right. Things need to change. I've introduced a bill today to finally fix our dodgy donation laws. I encourage the Prime Minister to take a good hard look at my proposal. My bill would fix our donation laws so that you have to disclose your donations if you give over two and a half thousand in a six month period and disclose it in real time. Income from fundraising dinners and your lobster dinners, where people can pay thousands for soggy chips just to see a minister, will finally be called for what it is, a donation. It's about time this government showed some leadership and told Australians the truth about what's going on behind closed doors. This is the bill, and it will do the job. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you very much. Uh, in talking with the matter of public importance, the ongoing failure to show leadership we look at the sort of, you know, uh, some examples have been given already about uh, from a number of commentators. Um, the the uh, government has already said that um, Nikki Sav is never welcome to um, another dinner or a fundraiser. Um, that uh, there's something fundamentally wrong when she's contradicting the prime minister, and of course the prime minister on the other hand saying, "Listen, I now listen." Well, you know, Nikki's one of yours, and you aren't listening. But here's another one of yours, John Hewson. John Hewson uh, wrote an op-ed on the 2nd of January. It said, "Where you were elected, he said this: where you were elected, you were elected to lead Scott Morrison. It was a surprise and great that you won against the polling, and you were marketing slogans cut through." Well, I'd say they'd probably give that a tick, wouldn't they? That's that's nailing it for for the government. But he goes on to say, "But there were only slogans. There was no detail." He went on to say, you are expected to govern in the national interest. He went further to say, prepare our nation to deal effectively with challenges before they become crises. More to say, nobody expects you to hold a hose against the fires. But they do reasonably expect you to lead with an immediate response to them and to implement a genuine long-term strategy to deal with what will be an increasing challenge in the future. I'm sorry, he went to say a bit more, former leader, opposition leader of the Liberal Party. Also, you have not shown the leadership expected to make us more drought resistant. Slogans, he went to say, slogans mask a shallowness of leadership skills and strategic thinking. Neither Donald Trump nor Boris Johnson should be your role model. Remember, Malcolm Turnbull failed to deliver the better government that he promised on seizing the leadership. In actual fact, it's not what Labor is saying, it's what the community is saying. That there are some simple, critical things. It's what the Liberal Party members are saying, senior activists. Now, some of those quieter strains that we referred to before, I'm not sure whether Nikki Saver and um, the ex-leader is an unquiet Australian, which we should disregard because they only happen to be, you know, have previously been an activist in the Liberal Party, but they have got one very important thing going for them, and that is that they are prepared not to be quiet and they're prepared to speak out. Well, some quiet Australians in Sydney, Melbourne Herald, uh, Sydney Morning Herald and Age 
report in February this year in an ISPIS research paper also revealed the majority support for greater action on climate change. Some participants see, see Scott Morrison, and I quote, irrevertibly damaged by the bushfire crisis and thought that this was particularly likely to be the case for voters in areas that were fire affected. We aren't raising these issues to be point scoring. We're raising these issues for the Prime Minister to listen, to take into account what the quiet Australians are saying, what your own are saying. And we start looking at the issues in the economy. We have a crisis in our economy. Wages growth is slowing to a few points from inflation. Rather than getting out of the way and letting unions, the main forces would, who would drive an increase in wages to do their work, something the Reserve Bank wants to happen, wages increasing, something the economists want to have happen, and something the government's hell-bent and standing in the way of. What they do is they come up with ideas like the Trade Union Royal Commission, the Ensuring Integrity Bill. God, Ensuring Integrity. I think Ensuring Integrity was reasonably described by another, um, another person, uh, another journalist, Michael Pascoe. He went to say, let's be very clear about this. The rorting of the $100 million community sports grants program was flagrant corruption and Prime Minister Morrison and senior ministers were in, in it up to their ethically devoid eyeballs. Now, the attempts to turn around and make sure that real policies make real differences for real people is to start dealing with the issues about wages being so low. It is about giving an opportunity for unions, for workers, for people to collectively stand up and fight for better wages and conditions. It's about actually saying not the Prime Minister not trumpeting employment rates when double the unemployment rate is with underemployment. Underemployment in regional and throughout Australia Senator is at a critical Sheldon, level. Sheldon, your time has expired. Senator Mullen. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, thank you very, very much. I rise to address the matter of public interest that we're, we're considering at the moment. And I've listened to uh, Senator Abetz and Senator Stoker and the, the logic and the understanding and the vision that they have shown. I've also listened to Senator Murray, to uh, Senator Faruqi, to Senator Polly and to Senator Sheldon. And I've heard half-truths, accusations, generalities, hysterics and media runs. And that's about all I've heard. I'm not too sure what I heard from Senator Lambie. But everyone in this House, Mr Acting Deputy President, everyone in this House should know, everyone who listened to the condolence motions yesterday or who has read the papers over the last six months, that this should be a time for sober, respectful reflection in a period where we're managing the drought, managing the coronavirus program, fighting the fires and commencing the bushfire recovery, and where our focus should be on the needs of those impacted by these national disasters. Not in the op but we don't see that in the opposition, we don't see it in the Greens and we didn't see it from Senator Lambie. The assessment of a national leader should never be limited to policies or plans or intentions or hopes alone, but should be based on the actuality of what leadership in this case delivers, and that is security and services to the people. This Prime Minister has delivered. What a leader does is assess the situation and act for the betterment of the people, not to posture or panic or rush about pointlessly as some previous leaders have done. As a national leader, the Prime Minister has acted decisively for the benefit of the people. Perhaps what this motion does, in fact, uh, 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 what it does, in, in fact, is to illustrate Senator Murray's, Faruqi, Polly and Sheldon's total misunderstanding of the nature of leadership. And I wonder if that says something about what they have in their own leaders. I wonder if they have never admitted that, with hindsight, they may have done things differently. I wonder if they, have, uh, they are all the epitome of leadership in all respects. If that is the case, I stand in absolute awe of them. Like every one of us who has experienced leadership, it is more than acceptable to admit after an event that, with the benefit of hindsight, perhaps indeed we would have done things differently. So admitting that you are not perfect is a strength of leadership. Assuming that you are perfect and have all the knowledge is an arrogance that got the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd government into so much trouble. It got them into trouble on border control and on pink bats in particular. 
we do not manage similar situations in the arrogant Labor way. And let's never forget that under Prime Minister Morrison's leadership, as Senator Abetz has reminded us, and his leadership was a key element, we stopped the boats, something that Labor could never do. And that level of leadership has, has been applied to all the Prime Minister's portfolios to this day. We've recovered the budget, despite being left a Labor legacy of the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd years of $46 billion. And we would expect to bring that budget at least back to balance this year. And who was the Treasurer for most of that period and, along with his team, should be given the credit of bringing us back into, into balance? And that was Prime Minister Morrison. The opposition may be surprised to hear that budgets don't just get themselves back into balance. They must be returned to balance by leadership, by inspiration, by discipline and by vision. That's what Prime Minister Morrison has done. The most important thing about being a leader is the ability to inspire and set the vision and to carry your team with you. Our strong financial management, management led by the Prime Minister, had Australia, has made Australia more resilient economically. So, As a leader, Prime Minister Morrison has been competent and successful, so competent and successful that since, uh, 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 since then, since his time on the boats and as Treasurer, he has won the Prime Ministership and, since then, an, an election. So let's face it, if you think that is unsuccessful leadership, then maybe that explains an awful lot about the lack of Labor's electoral success in the recent past. So let us also remember that as a, as a, federal, as a leader, a federal leader, Prime Minister Morrison has not only reacted to every request that the New South Wales government made of the federal government, as a good leader should, for assistance, uh, that, they, they, that was made for assistance during, during the bushfires. Uh, but at an appropriate time, he led, leant forward and he used the Australian Defence Force in an innovative way, which is what, exactly what leaders at a national level should do. I reject the, uh, uh, the, the motion Mullen, of public influence. Senator your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr um, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to this debate on the Prime Minister's ongoing failure to show leadership. And something that no clearly more demonstrates it for me in my portfolio areas is his failure to understand the impact that his lack of leadership in terms of our social security net is having on those people that are trying to survive on the absolutely appalling level of new start and the way that they are treating the most vulnerable members of our community is absolutely appalling. And it's all very well for the Prime Minister to think he's got lots of brownie points because, because he's got a surplus. It's a surplus on the back of the most vulnerable members of our communities, on the back of people who are living so far below the poverty line you can, it's, that they are going to find it very hard to get to be able to survive, and they are finding it very hard to survive. But not only are they struggling below the poverty line on Newstart, they're also the so-called employment services are absolutely failing them. And we've got to the point now where over 50 per cent of the people who are on Newstart are, are over the age of 45. And not only is the government thinks it's doing a good job by keeping people in poverty and not increasing the level of Newstart, which is so low and the government's failure to show leadership to increase it has meant that ACOS has had to increase its call for the level of increase to $95 from $75. But they're also planning to put people on Newstart, on disability support pension, on carers' pension, on the cashless debit card. We saw that comments over the weekend by the minister that she wants to roll out the cashless debit card across this country, including to those over people over 45, of which more than 50 per cent of people on Newstart are now over the age of 45, suffering from ageism, suffering from discrimination in the workplace, because they're finding it increasingly hard to find work. That is a total failure of leadership from this Prime Minister to recognise that he needs to act to increase New Start to ensure that people are no longer condemned to poverty, where they find it even harder to find. Senator Seward, work. time has expired. Um,
Um, Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise just to talk about some disappointment in terms of response by, the, uh, by, the Morrison, uh, by Prime Minister Morrison in relation to coronavirus. I'll just lead with some, uh, some, some facts. Our travel warning was, uh, was upgraded uh, to uh, a much more cautious uh, warning only after the UK government, the German government and the US government changed their travel warnings. It was the Chinese president that stopped direct flights from Wuhan to Australia, not the Australian Prime Minister. It was the government that did not order rigorous tracing of people who had arrived in Australia from Wuhan uh, uh, in the period immediately prior to the flights ban. And of course, we now know that's gone on, unfortunately, just to see two people in Adelaide and in Queensland infected. Uh, by the virus, uh, people who'd come from Wuhan. It was school principals in New South Wales that led in relation to barring students from attending school if they had visited China on an overseas holiday. In fact, uh, the, Mr Morrison sent his education minister out to say, that's the wrong move, it's business as usual. No, I'm sorry, not for the welfare of our, our children in schools. Um, it was Monash University that led in relation to dealing with the prospect of uh, arriving Chinese students. Uh, we then followed with some uh, relatively uh, good measures, but in all of this we have followed. The government took a glass half full uh, view to the coronavirus in circumstances where they needed to be taking a glass half empty view because uh, of the serious nature of uh, the coronavirus and its potential impact uh, on uh, Australians and their health. Uh, thankfully, we're in a better place now, but uh, if you examine what's happened, you wouldn't um, be impressed. Senator Patrick, your time has expired. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The fault for poor leadership cannot be laid entirely at the, at the feet of the Prime Minister because he went on summer holidays, as some people have alluded. The Prime Minister can't be on the job 24-7. He has an entire government to run the country. The entire government does not go on holidays. We had an acting Prime Minister, the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg. We had a Deputy Prime Minister, and still have a Deputy Prime Minister, Michael McCormack, who oddly was not considered the right person to step up to the top job. Mr McCormack's leadership qualities are, however, good enough for the National Party, it seems. Australia had two leaders on the job, Mr. President, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, one and a half. Australia was not without an acting Prime Minister. We were without leadership. If we are going to add to the fires with flaming tiki torches of our own, one nation would ask this place to direct that effort where it needs to go. We need to hold that acting leadership to account. We need to plan, more importantly, for the next fire event now. Um, thank you, Senators. Time for this debate has expired. I shall now proceed.